Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Georgia. I am an Italian information designer. I'm very, very happy to be here. This is my first time in Malmo. I'm very happy that I shared the stage with Mike, which had an incredible presentation. And so Martin asked me to talk about data visualization specifically, and which, as you may know, today is really blooming and blossoming, like online and in print. We every day see hundreds of examples of information that is presented through abstract and diagrammatic form. But um, instead of giving a lecture uh, or a lesson about the principle of data visualization, I simply try to show some of my works on the field and share with you what I've learned so far. And also what I think it's important to pursue, um, or I mean, if we hope to be innovative and original in the field. And um, this deals with titles, um, as I've been introduced. First of all, the title that I choose for my speak, which is Aesthetically Beautiful Experiences with Data. But also, it intrigued me a lot that this panel is called Understand and Visualize. And as you can see from this slide, I'll try also to play um, a little bit with it. So um, today I will talk about the work that we are doing at Accurate, which is a quite young information design company that I co-founded uh, back two years ago. And uh, just to give you a bit of a context, we have three partners with finally different background. I am an architect as a training, and I'm in charge of the representation of information. Uh, Gabriel is a designer, is a former film director, and now is managing the company. And Simona is a sociologist, and he works more on the content side. And now we are around 20 in our office in Milan, designers, graphic designers, developers, and producers who work permanently with us. And now we also have an office in New York, which we are very, very happy about. But really, before starting, I want to say how important it was and it has been for me and for us to have built a team throughout these years. So it's only me speaking here, but the work that I'm showing is really the effort of an entire team. Um, I'll present the visual data column, which is a column we regularly publish on Cordera della Sera, which is uh, one of the main Italian newspaper, showing you some different pieces and the aims that we have, and also some intermediate stages and sketches and how the pieces evolve through times. And then I'll show you some other visualization that we did, but this time trying to start from a very inspiration that we have visually, which I think it's important in this context. And I'll try to conclude tracing a red thread among all. So uh, this project for Correa de la Sera, we've been doing it uh, for a year so far. And the newspaper that you see here is the one we publish. It's called La Lettura, which can be translated in English like the act of reading. And it's a Sunday cultural supplement of the newspaper. It's a sort of um, long read collection of articles about cultural phenomena, sociological phenomena, but also communication and media related issues. And the aim of the history, so that you have it, you can have a little bit of a context, is that one of providing their readers with a sort of product that they could read throughout all their week. So it's kind of deep and dense. We regularly publish on that, and we publish a story that each time is told through a data visualization instead than through an article. And uh, we really have the chance to every time choose the topic we want to explore. Sometimes it's just a fascination that we have. Sometimes it's a compelling data set that we find. And some other times our cho choice is driven by like hot topics that we want to cover at the moment. We find our own data sets, and so all of the information we want to correlate. Uh, we find the most interesting point of view through which to tell the story, as we see. We imagine a visual model that, as you can have a preview, try to be non-conventional every time, and we visualize. And so we every time aim at providing our readers through what we call a multi-layered storytelling with a kind of first story that you can maybe spot immediately as a glance. But then we try to let the readers like go in deeps with the details, in like exploring marginal or secondary stores. And to do this, we really try to e experiment with new visual metaphors. And well, just to be clear, also according all of the ongoing conversation on data, lies, and truth, um, we here are doing pieces of journalism in a way, which we are telling story from a point of view, which is ours, like from our researches, from our choices about the information to choose and to correlate, with the aim of letting readers explore a topic or like letting them know something they didn't know before. Let's talk about some concrete pieces. So um, I found it interesting here to look back at the full set of our data visualization and talking um, with you about everything starts. 
Sometimes ideas come just like an enlightenment, like, and the overall architecture of the visualization is driven by a kind of sudden intuition you like to represent, even before knowing if you will be able to find the data. And this is one of these cases. This is a comparison of three of the most important historical headlesses of the world, and it visually compares how these three book different covers, time spans, topics, and geography. And this is one of the visualizations that just come um, from an idea that I tried to sketch here, which was how our mental perception of an historical period can be distorted in our mind depending on the way we studied it, meaning on how much time we spend on it. Can we visualize it? So you have to know that in Italy, we study, I don't know about you guys, but we study history in a total linear chronological way. So in, let's say, five years of high school, as an example, we would have the first year, which is totally dedicated to the ancient times, the second year, which covers the medieval period, the third year, which covers the Renaissance, and then the fourth year, that is like from the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, and the last year, which is totally focused on the period from the First World War up to nowadays. And so, you know, you really spend the same amount of time, like one year, studying very different time spans in number of centuries. And we tried with this idea. We selected three important historical atlases, and each of the three books have been analyzed to first find out the different importance, in terms here of number of pages, given to half a century, centuries, and millennia. And then we, s we had some other informations. But the visualization was almost there. So we used this, ver this first um, headless on the top of the page to host the key for the readers. And so each headless is represented with a real timeline, which is the bottom one, merged with a distorted timeline, which is the top horizontal one, which is altered in terms of space according to the number of pages that each book gives to the various periods. Then at the bottom of each headless, is we added some marginal stories, like the visualization shows a chromatic comparison of different types of events, like society-related events, uh, uh, like with colors, religious, economical, war-related event. And also we have continents, which are this dot below, and which are geographical areas that the book mainly covers through years. And just to give you something about the result, actually, as we imagined before, all atlases agreed that the 20th century is really the key historical century. And talking about the topics, a lot is told about society and politics, witnesses that history is not only made of worse. And interesting differences also came up once visualized as to geographical localization. So Diagostini is mainly talking about European, Zanichel is more focused on the East, and Garzanti is more global. Here, after the initial sketches, there are some intermediate steps where we're trying to fit all the data in these kind of three timelines. But you know, the idea behind that is very simple, visualizing a sort of possible mental distortion of time perception simply given by how much we study different periods. And once visualized, it's even more clear in mind. So, as I was saying, sometimes that visualization can from a fascination, but oftentimes, as you may expect, with this kind of sudden intuition doesn't happen, we have to start by selecting a topic, looking for some interesting data set, digging into the data, and looking at something compelling to represent. And just after that, we figure out how to visualize that. This other one is one of the latter cases. So, Painters in the Making has been inspired by, um, by an article that we found on The New Yorker by Malcolm Gladwell, and the article just focused on the ages at which certain famous people reached their fame, and we just had this idea to try to do it with artists, and particularly with painters, which also give a lot of possibility, like visually speaking, showing in which period of their life most famous painters created their masterpiece. But everything was totally visually unclear to us at the beginning. We just had ages and painters, but no visual ideas yet. This is the actual overall picture of the visualization. It's the two, um, page, um, two pages spread. And you can see that we ended up building a sort of vertical timeline, highlighting centuries with these vertical lines that you see. There are the lines of the painter's life divided into a young, adult, and mature period. But let's go with the process and then elaborate a bit more uh, on the differences about how everything starts. So the selection of the most important paintings has been done according to the Garzanti Art Encyclopedia. But then, tricky was that we have to define our own criteria to choose which painting to consider as the masterpiece for each artist. 
And this is a zoom, and you can see that. So we first selected, OK, again, an institutional point of view, the masterpiece according to Garzanti Art Encyclopedia, which is the doubled frame square that you see. But then we also wanted to have a kind of popular point of view, a less institutional one. And we picked the first result related to the name of the painters on Google Images, which is the other one that you see is not squared. And we represented it as well. And then the depiction of the painting was an opportunity to add their further layer of information, like the, co the main colors that you can see within the, square, the frame of the squares, and also the painting technique with the small symbol that you can see. And it's funny to notice when visualize that for most of part of the painters, the two sources, so the institutional and the popular point of view, do not display the same piece. And also it's funny to notice that for, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci, some pieces that we really consider important, like the Mona Lisa, well, it simply doesn't appear. And then we also tried to look at the big picture of the story, and we tried to propose an overview to see how patterns change through time. And again, once visualized, it's nice to confirm what we probably already imagined, like the bright colors appearing early in the last centuries, and then we had dark colors before, and pastel colors before. And then we tried to find, to, to put a kind of clear legend that if you experiment with non-common visual model, it's kind of important. But coming back to the entire piece and the process, so as often happens, as the visualization is taking its final form, we really realized that our initial idea was really just a jump off point. So our initial concept were focusing about ages and painters' ages that were represented in the masterpiece. But the more the visualization matured and the more we were digging into data and visualizing them, the more we started to think of it all as a, just a kind of synoptic map uh, of these painters. Because we really feel like digging into data that this was the big pictures that were interesting to give. And then the age of the painter just become one of the elements to represent. So understand and visualize, or visualize and understand? Um, of course, there's no any unique answer here. It really depends, but I do think that it's important to stop and think a bit about that. So coming to big data, of course, the more the size and the amount of data you are to analyze grows, the more maybe you need to understand in order to visualize, in, sorry, to visualize in order to understand. Sometimes when you're dealing with smaller data, you can definitely spot patterns also from a spreadsheet or just by drafting a simple chart out of the spreadsheet. But even if talking about small data, if you allow me this word, the two visualizations that I showed before, I mean, we didn't really have huge amounts of data to visualize. It was just spreadsheet on Excel. But and even these two pieces started from some intuition that we have, still, until the visualization was complete, lots of things wouldn't show up. Like, we wouldn't notice them. We wouldn't understand and have these big pictures that you can have once the data are visualized. And to me, this happening a lot when you are trying to deal with non-typical processes of information, like when you're dealing with a singular data set, you cannot, when you're not dealing with singular data set, you can simply draft a chart about. And this led me to the last part of my presentation. So uh, when you are to visualize compound system of information, rich data sets, or data sets that you yourself are crossing, it's really hard to rely on standard visual models and metaphors. And also, as the variety of data grows, and also as tools are very, very easy and ready to be used to create standard data visualization, I really feel that we need to look somewhere else to be inspired if you want to try to be original. And well, what I do is I draw what I see. I draw a lot. I have this kind of obsession with drawing. But before that, I try to look very carefully at the things that I like, being abstract painters or just an architecture or a random image, and try really to understand what is that I like of what I see? Is it the overall balance of the composition? Is it the features of the singular elements or the colors? And then the very act of drawing, and it's not only me saying that, it's help introduce what I would call a sort of level of abstraction that can help translate uh, elements that you like in some clues, new clues for your design. I don't know if it makes sense apart in my head, but I try to share it with you. So as an example, this visualization is called the brain drain, and it just explored the phenomenon of the global brain drain. And I'll be very quick, and then I'll come to inspiration. So here, the countries, because all of these elements that you see are countries we selected, are positioned uh, according to two main values, like the number of researchers per million people and the GDP that each country dedicates to the research and development field. 
And then each country is displayed by contrasting lots of information, helping uh, readers discover its situations in terms of how many researchers go abroad, how many researchers enter the country, how many are coming back after a period abroad, and also giving a little bit of a context about the country, like including regular populations, immigration and immigration, uh, unemployment rate, female employment rate, and university ranking to provide a possible correlation. But anyway, so uh, the idea of this visualization, like visually speaking, came to me after a visit to MoMA's Inventing Abstraction Exhibition, which was in New York in November. And the visit actually happened during the first days we were analyzing this data on the researchers. And during the visit, I was really told to wish to come up with the kind of data visualization able to replicate this kind of geometrical feeling, pleasant aesthetics and primary coloring that I was catching down during the exhibition because, of course, I spent all of the time like, just drawing things that I noticed. And then each country that we were analyzing started to happen to me as something like a compound element displayed with very geometrical shapes. And then, yes, in these sketches, we were deciding just which parameters to use for describing the countries. And here is the stage where elements start to have their shape, like even digitally. And I just really wanted to keep this with primary colors, as Mondrian was teaching a lot. But here we are with the final again. And you can totally spot, I think, how this kind of modern paintings exhibition that I was looking at really played its role on the piece. And again, taking a step back, here we don't have big data, you know, but we have lots of information we correlated, and patterns among countries and researchers or interesting phenomena just emerge once we visualize them. This is another one. Uh, this is the last piece that I'm showing today, so I'm almost done. Uh, this tells the story of Nobel Prizes through years, and I'm here again talking about the inspiration. So briefly, just to explaining what it's about. For each uh, Nobel Prize, we visualize the prize category, the year the prize was awarded, uh, the age of the recipient of the time, as well as the principal uh, academical affiliations. And these six main rows highlighted by colors represent prize categories along a timeline, and each dot that you see represent a Nobel laureate, and each guy is positioned according to the year the prize was awarded and the age he has or she has at the time of the award. And then these hearts right there represent a principal university affiliation, and the bar chart on the right represent another aggregation per category, which is the grade um, uh, level, like if PhD or not even degreed. And this small double uh, rounded guy that you see in pink it highlights the women among the overall, which are not so many, actually. But I don't really want to go in depth on it. Just look at the overall. So musical score, they are very fascinating, no? So many, many times I just find myself replicating, simply replicating shapes, lines, and connection that refers to the musical panorama that I just like it with no idea of what I'm doing on which purpose. And I'm really also visually love the so-called graphic music notation, so contemporary music notation, notation using non-traditional symbols, colored lines and tests to convey information about how the performance and so the musical piece should be played. And John Cage, which is one of the most famous authors here, and I really think that I don't need to say more. Can you spot some similarities in the visualization I was showing before? And just a quick overview of the first sketch is that I tried to simply follow this idea of building parallel scores, helping highlighting some differences we noticed within the data. And the visualization was pretty clear. Again, these are some intermediate stages when we were starting doing it digitally. And lots of people asked me why we rotate the visualization. So why just, like, just turn as a bit of a slope? Well, to be honest, the lack of a space played its role on that. But the rotation we tried while fitting the data isn't just like incredibly more elegant in terms of composition, so it worked. Um, and here we are back again. So I can share my inspiration with you, or I mean the digital part of them, because I have this Pinterest board that I really, really use as a collector. If I like something digitally, I pin something, I save it for later. It's a sort of silly ritual to me that it really helped me to create a, data, a database in a way, a visual database of things that I love that I can come back later like to find inspiration without looking randomly on the internet. Conclusion. Oh. Here we are supposed to have a video that is not... Okay, great. Showing. So these are just 
pieces uh, starting from the sketches and becoming actual data visualization so that you can enjoy some comparison while I talk about my conclusion. So as you may uh, have got, our idea is that we always try to build what I will call aesthetical experiences, aesthetically beautiful experiences with data to catch the reader eyes first. But not only, then we really love to try to help in understanding something that they didn't know before. Um, spotting similarities, compare and play. I'm sorry, the video is quite slow, but anyways. And this deals with how we shape the visual models and how we try to be elegant and simple, even maintaining uh, the complexity of data. And we do know that there is a science, or let's say, recognized principle uh, for representing information, and that they are worth to be pursued in most of the cases. But that doesn't mean that there's an hand and that everything is already settled and concluded. So many, many times, bar charts, cutter plots, regular um, timelines and maps, they are the best way to convey information as messages we did. We really simply believe that keeping on to explore the realm of possibilities in this representation of information, here that we can do that because we're not supposed to visualize data for decision making, but we are doing entertainment, could also lead to refine, in a way, and perfecting this kind of core of this science, even passing through failures and mistakes. And drawing the parallel with art, such like as painting and music through centuries, we know how much these disciplines have always been able to reinvent themselves constantly, even when a reinvention wasn't needed, but opening new worlds and possibilities. And I, we just simply, that here, the interesting question is, how far can we go? That's it. <laughs>